Howard will be appearing by, by video. I'm happy to report that both of them are longtime RCA members. Howard has been an avid observer and telescope maker since the age of 11. He's a contributing editor for Sky and Telescope magazine and is especially known for his careful observing notes and detailed sketches. He also wrote 176 articles for the Rosette Gazette, which is RCA's publication, in a regular column called Observer's Corner from 1992 to 2014, and has published 22 articles in Amateur Astronomy magazine. Dan Gray is the founder and owner of Technical Marine Services and the founder of Sidereal Technology. He generously provides our club with access to the facilities and resources of Technical Marine Services for our telescope workshops. Sidereal Technology manufactures and sells excellent telescope control hardware that's especially popular among club members and Oregon Star Party attendees. Dan is also a very active member of the Alt As Initiative, which is a collection of professional and amateur astronomers with the, goals of, with the goal of making meter scale telescopes more widely available. In his work with Sidereal Technologies and the Alt As Initiative, he travels the world to provide and improve technologies for controlling and operating telescope mounts, focusers, rotators, and cameras for both amateur and professional telescopes. Beyond all of this, Dan was one of the creators of the club's science special interest group and is known for some of the great telescopes that he's built. Dan and Howard received substantial support in their presentation from Victor's Burstis, who doesn't want anybody to know that. <laughs> Victor's, Victor's was a senior software developer at IBM and he's the director of our cosmology and astrophysics SIG. Wow, that was a lot. After all that, please give a warm welcome to Dan Gray. My gosh, that's a lot of people. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, if anybody doesn't want their picture taken, cover your head. Because I'm going to send this to my wife. <laughs> <laughs> Got that out of the way. <laughs> All right, let's see. Is the laser working? Yeah. Got to turn backwards. Get it pointed at your stomach. <laughs> I might have to do that. <laughs> okay, so Howard uh, sent me an email saying he had a flat tire or or uh, his dog ate his homework or something like that. <laughs> I'm Howard Banich, and I am giving my part of this presentation through this video. I'm uh, on vacation, and uh, it's strictly my fault that I'm not here in person with you because I didn't realize I had a conflict. But um, that's not unusual for me. <laughs> However, hopefully this will come across well, and uh, we'll be able to present how we blink the Crab Nebula pulsar. Um, Dan Gray and I, um, along with eight other observers, were able to do this almost 10 years ago now. All right, so um, we're going to talk a little about some maybe boring stuff to some of you, and some of you already know this, and probably better than I am, than I know it. I'm definitely not an astrophysicist, but I know that everybody here comes here because they are interested in science, astronomy, uh, the big questions in our lives that we want to answer. And uh, so let me uh, just start by, okay, let's see. I have two paths I want us to look at tonight. And one is this path right here, because that's what our sun is going to do. And one is this path over here, because that's what happened to the crab pulsar. 
And uh, we <coughs> both in both cases it started out with a cloud of gas, and uh, then the sun was created by gravitational attraction, and then uh, nuclear fusion inside of that, and then it, they started it started running out of or it will unfortunately not yet, but it will <laughs> run out of fuel in about four or five billion more years, so we better plan ahead. And <laughs> then it's going to make a beautiful planetary nebula that we none of us will probably ever see. And then, uh, then it's going to turn into a white dwarf. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about the white dwarfs. Let's see what's next. Oh, yeah. How many of you seen a white dwarf? Raise your hands. Wow, I am really, really shocked. That's really amazing. And it was probably this one, is that right? So, this is my most memorial, mem memorable memory at our, at our trip to the 9 inch Bach telescope, besides looking at the Crab Pulsar. And Howard made this wonderful drawing, and he took wonderful notes. Uh, you can see the little pup right there. And, and then, this is what he wrote. You can read that. And then he also wrote, or he also, or we all also viewed the trapezium. And look at all those stars in there that we could see. That was wonderful. And this is a blow up of Howard's drawing. And you can see there was just a little bit of tracking error right there. <laughs> okay, so we're going to talk about some basic physics uh, that maybe I'm trying to understand, and hopefully I don't mislead anybody, but uh, the Pauli exclusion principle, and this is what holds up white dwarf stars. Uh, uh, Wolfgang Pauli discovered, he didn't figure, he, he actually discovered it because it has always been that way, but he dis discovered that fermions, which is protons, neutrons, and electrons, can't have the same quantum state, spin, and energy. Energy includes three quantum numbers that I'm not going to get into. It's over my head. <laughs> okay, so uh, if the resulting core of a supernova is heavier than the Pauli exclusion limit, it will collapse to a neutron star. Uh, the limit is thought to be about 1.4 solar masses. And uh, the, the electron degeneracy pressure is what keeps the white dwarf com from uh, collapsing further. And this is... Uh, Wolfgang Pauli, and uh, he received a Nobel Prize, a well-deserved Nobel Prize, in uh, 1945. Okay, here's a few more facts. Uh, white dwarf, dwarf star has about a half, the, half the mass of our sun, but is only slightly larger than the Earth. So can you believe that? So half of the mass of our sun is going to turn into our white dwarf. The density is going to be about 200,000 times the Earth's den density. On Earth, a teaspoonful of white dwarf would weigh about 15 tons. So that's a lot of buses and trucks. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the law of angular motion. Our star, the sun, rotates once every 26 days. But when it becomes a white dwarf, it's going to start spinning a hell of a lot. Whoops. A lot faster. <laughs> and I have a little demonstration about that. So I have to put down the microphone because it's going to take two hands. So you've all seen the skater and the twirling your arm. Well, I've got to get out of that light. Okay, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to twirl this around with just a string and away from the pizza pie. And then I'm going to pull it. See that? Cool experiment, huh? <laughs> I'm gonna show that to my grandson. Okay. Uh -oh. Is this the wrong mic? Uh -oh. Wrong mic. <laughs> okay, we're gonna Okay. So where are we at now? Okay, so that's that. Alright, so now we're gonna go oh no, a formula. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, they say you're not supposed to put formulas in talks. Well, I'm giving the talk, so I decided to put a formula in. And the reason that I decided to put this formula in is it was one that even I could understand. <laughs> okay, so let's just look at this. Whoops. Okay, here we are. All right. So it's a really simple formula. You, uh, 
this the um, the P big is a, okay, P is a period, R is a radius. R sun it has a 26 day period roughly, it varies. And then if you plug these numbers in, it's gonna read, when it's a white dwarf star, it's gonna be three minutes, once every three minutes. When it's a, but that's only if it receives all its, if all of its mass went down there, which it won't. So it'll be slower than that. But still, that's a lot faster than 26. Okay, but there is a limit to the, um, to what a what will create the white dwarf, and that's called the Chandra's Sekar limit. I hope I say that right. <laughs> the limit is about 1.4 solar masses. If the original supernova leaves a core greater than this limit, it will collapse to a neutron star. And then a little bit of history about uh, I can't say that name, but Chandra's Sekar. I might be pronouncing that part sort of close. So this is really interesting. He was 19 years old, and he, his, his family wanted him to stay in India, but he really wanted to get an education. And he took a steamship from India to England. And he calculated with pen or pencil and paper the electron degeneracy pressure. It's now called the Canvas Carbon. And he received a Nobel Prize for that. And here he is. I put the picture in just for fun. Okay, so now once again, we're going to uh, look at life cycles. And it's going to be Howard. He does a great job talking about uh, the supernovas and uh, the collapse of the neutron star. Um, Dan Gray and I, um, along with eight other observers, we're able to do this almost 10 years ago now. But before we get into that, um, you know, let's give a little background on what is the Crab Nebulose Pulsar. I mean, what is this? You've probably heard about it, but maybe you don't know what's going on. Well, it's essentially, it's the collapsed core of a star that exploded out of a supernova. And the remaining part of the star is called a neutron star. Dan will get into some of the specifics on, on what is involved with the neutron star a little bit later. But basically, that's, that's what we're talking about when we're talking about the pulsar. And we'll get a little more detail in just a minute. Now, the rest of the exploded remains of that star became the Crab Nebula. And that's still expanding. Now, the neutron star, the Crab Nebula's pulsar, is approximately 12 20 kilometers in diameter, about 12 miles, and is a sphere of tightly packed neutrons and rotates about 30 times per second. You can see the precise value on the screen, um, very close to 30, about 30 hertz. And it has a collimated beam of sick neutron radiation blasting out from each of the magnetic poles. So this is basically there's two bright spots whipping around, and one of those beams points in our direction, and we can see that. And we see that come our way 30 times a second. And that beam is charged particles being accelerated through the magnetic field of the, of the neutron star. And that actually helps accelerate the expansion of the Crab Nebula. It's an incredible object. And what makes the Crab Pulsar even more special is that it is by far the brightest known optical pulsar. It has a visual magnitude of 16.5, which is really faint. <laughs> I mean, how many of you can see a star that's 16.5 magnitude in your telescope? Not very many, I'm sure. It's, this is a faint object, but this is the brightest of its class. <clears throat> so how did it form? So this is pretty incredible how we got the Crab Pulsar. Um, the star was, was in the Crab Pulsar now is 6,500 light years away. The, the original mass is about 10 times the mass of our sun. So this was a really big star. But it was an old star, and it lost its ability to fuse elements in its core. And this is in about 5,400 BCE, or BC which we prefer. 
and that outward pressure of, of diffusion was suddenly lost. And then within seconds, the star's crushing gravity collapsed that core into that 20 kilometer or 12 mile, mile diameter sphere of neutrons. Now just think of that. This huge star and its core within seconds collapsed into a neutron star. Now simultaneously, the outer layers of the star come crashing down on this now super dense neutron core at 23% the speed of light. Now that layer <coughs> explodes off of the neutron star core and it becomes this a star shattering type two supernova. Now at that, at that through the course of the, the supernova's life, which lasted for over a year, at its brightest, it was brighter than the entire Milky Way galaxy. 6,500 years after this explosion, because it's 6,500 light years away, Chinese astronomers and, and other countries uh, around the world saw this brilliant, the Chinese call it a guest star, the pre-dawn sky near Zeta Tauri. That's a, one of the uh, stars in the constellation of Taurus on the morning of July 4th, 1054. Now, I, I especially love this because it's the precise date. And that just gives you a, a wonderful example of the, the value of taking good notes. <laughs> <laughs> now, for 23 days, it was so bright it could be seen in broad daylight. Um, and at night, it had a reddish white color. It had a maximum magnitude of minus six, so that's a lot brighter than, than Venus is at its brightest and it took more than a year to gradually fade from sight. So this was a tremendous event. But he collapsed. So how many of you recognize that bookcase? <laughs> It's Victor's. <laughs> <laughs> uh, from the science book, uh, Victor's sponsors that, and it's at his house, and there's goodies there, and it's, uh, and it's really good. And, and he took these videos. Um, Howard went there, and I went there, and he took all these videos, and then he edited them, and he's very good at it. Thank you, Victor's. Welcome, Dale. <laughs> All right, so this is a really nice am am amination. And you can actually see, on the one on the left, I believe it was a Chan, the, the X-ray telescope, what's it called, Richard Chan? Chandra, yes. Oh, I gotta put this in a loop mode. Hold on. Okay, and on the right is a Hubble Space Telescope. What's it really amazing to me is that in just the last couple of decades, we've been able to see the movement in this over the years. Isn't this an amazing video? I could not be this put in there. Um, what's that? What's the time date? Is this real time? Oh, no, 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 this is, uh, this is over years. I don't know how many is this, but just, you know, they did it over a number of years. Okay, con, con, con. okay, we're back to this formula again. <laughs> <laughs> and this one is about uh, Betelgeuse or Betelgeuse. And this one didn't work out for me. And I think it's because I used the, the rotational speed of, of uh, Betelgeuse. And, and the reason I chose Betelgeuse is it's going to be a supernova real soon. It could be in our lifetimes, it could be in tens of thousands of years, but it's going to happen. And, uh, it's, it's going to be a similar product of uh, like the Crab Pulsar. And what I came out with was 100,000 revolutions per second. Now something's wrong with that. And the, I think the problem is that a, a small fraction of the mass of that is going to be actually in the Pulsar. Because the Pulsar is only, only going to be about one and a half, two um, er, uh, solar masses. And so it's, it's a lot more than that. It's 10 times the mass of the sun. So a lot of that angular motion isn't there. Okay, so that's wrong. Okay, so now how fast are we moving on the Earth's server? We're sitting here 
on, the, on our planet and we're rotating once per day, correct? Well, that works out, let's see here. <coughs> so here's another formula, and this is even simpler, simpler than the last one. So you plug in the period and the radius, and we get the velocity. And it turns out, this is all in, in meters and, and stuff like that. That's the meters of the radius of the Earth, and that's how many seconds is in a day. And it turns out that we're moving about a thousand miles an hour right now as the Earth is turning. Okay. So let's see what happens. Crab full size. Okay, we already know its period. Its, per it's period is, uh, is uh, 0.033 seconds. And it turns out to be 1,800,000 meters per second, or 4,200,000 miles per hour. Oh. If you're able to swim on, <laughs> <laughs> of course you would be about two or three atoms thick if you did. <laughs> okay. Okay, this is the fastest known pulsar, and I have it on good authority that this pulsar spins faster than the very fastest blender that you can buy. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops. Same formula, but here the the period is about one millisecond. <coughs> and so you end up going 15, if you're on the surface of that one, you'd be going 15% of the speed of light. Oh my God. Okay, now we're gonna, we talked about um, uh, electron degeneracy pressure, and now we're gonna talk a little bit about neutron degeneracy pressure. I'm proud I can even say that in the word. Okay, let's see here. The limit they, that was calculated by uh, oh, I don't have the names up. I'm sorry, I must have forgot that. But it's thought to be about 2.16 solar masses. It was actually less than that. And, and then the gravitational wave merger of the, of, of the two, two uh, neutron stars, they were able to, to nail it down. And this is what they, the latest, what they think it is. That's the limit. And uh, that's quite higher than this 1.4 solar masses of electron degeneracy pressure. If the mass turns out to be more than that limit, it turns into a black hole instead of a neutron star. And then you, the teaspoonful is going to be 10,000 tons. Remember, how much was it for, for, a, for a, a white dwarf? I mean, 15 tons. So, and that's because the, uh, the white dwarf is about as big as the Earth, right? This is only uh, 20 kilometers or about 12 miles in diameter. So, and so that's why it's so much more dense. And this, and the interesting thing about it is that if you weigh, I mean, they know how much a neutron, or a, yeah, neutron weighs. They know how much a, a neutron weighs. And so this weighs the same as if it was just pure neutron. Isn't that cool? There's no space anymore. Okay, so the maximum mass of a neutron star, and it's thought to be one. Uh, it's, I said 2.16, now it's 2.17. I must have read a different paper. <coughs> so if heavier, it has to uh, uh, collapse into a black hole. Now, I see we have plenty of time. And I, I have a thought experiment. And, I've t and in my travels and working on these telescopes, I've had a chance to talk to PhD astronomers. And I always ask them the same question. And they either don't specialize in it, or they don't have an answer. But I did talk to one. He's not yet a PhD, uh, he's at the University of Arizona. And he said he thinks that maybe it's true. I, I wonder about if there's really a singularity in a black hole. Now here's why. Um, the time dilation of, of uh, relativity, um, when you cross that event horizon, time stops, right? So none of the matter that's fallen into the hole, into the black hole or across the event horizon, has had time yet for it to reach the singularity. And so that's just one thought experiment. So you take uh, a neutron star and say it happens to be right at that limit. Okay, it's very close to the limit. And uh, it's in a binary system, so it's picking up a little more mass, and then suddenly it reaches that limit and goes over it. What's gonna happen? Well, I don't know. I, I can't say for sure. I'm not a mathematician. I'm not, I'm not an astrophysicist. But it's, it's something to think about, and it's fun to think about. Okay.
So this is the heaviest neutron star that we've discovered so far. And it's 2.14 solar masses, and that's really close to that limit. That's oh, I did put it in there. Hohmann, Oppenheimer, Volkoff limit. Okay. Anyway, and whenever they find a neutron star, and it happens to be in a double star system, then they can get a lot more information about it, especially if, it, if it's an eclipse. And it's just amazing. They can do, figure out masses very accurately and stuff using Doppler effects, etc. Okay. Anyway, it's uh, 4,600 light years away. And let's see next. Okay, now we're going to talk about the temperature of neutron stars. They start out, well, the surface of the sun is about 5,800 degrees Kelvin. So, you know, zero degrees Kelvin is absolute zero. So, and then it goes in, in the same engineering units as degree C. So, newly formed neutron stars are 10. Now, the little number right on the end there just means add a bunch of zeros, half any zeros. So, that's a lot of, a lot of zeros. So, that's it. we're talking billions and even more. And then, um, they cool off in just a few years because of uh, neutrinos. They give off a lot of neutrinos. And I read that, or I didn't read it. I watched this YouTube video right there. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I learned that. And by the way, I just wanted to say, I've really learned a lot about white dwarfs and, and neutron stars in the last month or two. <laughs> it's been a lot of fun. OK, next. OK, the pressure. So the, um, the Pascals, okay. Right now, in this room, it's about 10 to the fourth. It's a little bit more. Bottom of, of the ocean, 10 to the fourth. So that's 10,000, 10, right? Okay, math and the math, it's just mathematician. <laughs> okay, so 10 to the eighth is the pressure at the bottom of the ocean. 10 to the tenth, tenth. okay, 10 to the eighth, how much is that? So that would be, thank you, what's 10 to the, 10 to the 10th, somebody. Quick. 10 billion. 10 billion. 10. What about the 11th? 100 billion. 100 billion. Okay, let's see. <coughs> center of the Earth. Center of the Sun. Center of a white dwarf. dwarf. Okay, come on. Spit it on somebody. <laughs> okay. Um, pressure at the center of the neutron star. Blocks. Blocks. <laughs> oh, gosh. That's amazing. Okay, now again, I want the same YouTube video right there. And, and the reason I, I want to, we're going to put this online and I'll have somebody get it on the RCA uh, group. Um, because these links that I'm providing are, are so wonderful. I've just really enjoyed them. Okay, let's see, where am I at? Oh, magnetic field. Okay, so we start with Earth's magnetic field, which is really, really small. Um, I, I decided to not say micro Tesla and to write it all out, but I forgot to erase the U. So, but really, it's 32 micro Teslas. That's pretty weak. That's our Earth. That's what we are in right now. Refrig refrigerator magnet. It's a lot more concentrated. So it's five milli Teslas. Um, MRI machine, and I've been in, I've been in a few. <laughs> <laughs> Three Teslas. Typical white dwarf, a hundred Teslas. Now, a lot of that magnetism comes from the, the magnetism in the mass of, of the, of the clap, clap, collapsing star, and so it gets really increased greatly. <clears throat> Neutron stars, wow, they're very magnetic. Now, physicists say that there is not enough magnetism in the star that formed the, uh, the neutron star. There's not enough magnetism for that. So there's a lot of other physics involved. And uh, I read something about some alignment of molecules and crystals and uh, you know, uh, crystalline structures. It's quite complicated and over my head. But they're very magnetic. And then there's also magnetars, which uh, there's star quakes on these magnetars sometimes. And when there's a star quake, the, the surface of the uh, neutron star can move just a few atoms or a few just teeny tiny amount, and it creates such a massive uh, magnetic disturbance and, and x-rays and stuff 
And it, you can actually kill a planet that's nearby because of that. So that's amazing. Yeah. Fortunately, we don't have any in our neighborhood. <laughs> okay, so I found this one online and I thought it was very beautiful. So I am going to play this video. Now this one really needs sound effects. So you can see the pink parts right there. And that's what we see in the crab pulsar. Uh, when we look in the telescope and see the pulsar, we're seeing, uh, and I, I, I'd say it did look purple. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but, um, these are the magnetic lines of force around this very small, remember it's really small, it's only 20 kilometers or 12 miles or so. So, and, and I just thought this was a beautiful video. And since it was public or, you know, NASA, I can use it without getting permission. Nice. Okay. Now, I think the next thing, I think it's powered. Oops. Oh, no. Okay, so I wanted to talk about the discovery of pulsars. And this is really a wonderful story. I just can't believe how wonderful it is. And I'll, I'll give you a link to a YouTube video where I learned most of this stuff later on. So, uh, Jocelyn Bell is a, really the discoverer, the main discoverer of pulsars. And so I watched this video and I was captivated by it and it was just wonderful. And so I sent her an email and I got a nice response. So I sent her, I didn't understand, and I'll, you'll see in the next picture, I couldn't understand how they pointed the declination. Well, I'm still working on that, but um, uh, this is, so I, I asked her in the email, because I, I told her I was gonna be giving a talk. And, and here's what her telescope looked like. I'm not actually sure if this is her telescope, but it looks the same. Now, now the wires come, this is the supporting wires here, and then this whole thing is pointed south. This, all these rows are pointed east and west, so that the array is pointed south. And what, so what she said is the east-west rows, they, they have delays and they might generate delays. I'm not sure if, it might be the delays coming from the angle or something like that, but I'm not, so I don't fully understand. I'm still working on it, but it was nice to hear from her. <laughs> <laughs> it did. Okay. So, and, and this is really wonderful. Now, the point we have to realize is, you know, we're talking about looking at the crab pulsar. And I meant to find out how many visual pulsars that there are, or, you know, visual spectrum. And I forgot to do that. But it's a really low number. Almost all of them are radio pulsars. And we didn't see a radio pulsar in our chocolate. Okay. <laughs> so. We're going to look at the following slide, and there's going to be a little piece of noise. And Jocelyn poured her over those charts, you know, daily, and then she would line up uh, the the prior day, and you know, the so the sidereal day is based. It changes four four minutes a day, different, roughly four minutes a day, different than this than the solar day, and so. So she saw this and it noticed it happened every four, four minutes earlier every day. And so, but if you look at it, okay, I hope you can see this. So this is what she was seeing. She was seeing a little teeny glitch right here. Well, look, at there's some noise here too. And, and what's the difference? How can you tell that? Well, what, a, what, ga what, was a, what gave it away to her was it happened four minutes earlier every day. And, and it, you know, so one of the explanations was a car would drive by with a noisy ignition four minutes earlier every day. <laughs> okay, so she needed more resolution. Now, uh, they were wondering what it was, and, and was it LGM? Now, LGM stands for little green person. <laughs> so, well, I already said that about the car, didn't I? Or was it some astronomical phenomenon? Um, some ideas put forth an oscillating optic like a Cepheid variable. Well, Cepheid variables, the fastest ones are just on a few days, but, and some of them are like months long. So 
probably not it. Uh, an orbiting object eclipsing a radio source. No, because it would be on most of the time and then off a little bit. Uh, a rotating object. So, so here's another chart. Now this one is really, really cool. Because this is when she was, she would go out at four minutes earlier every day and she would turn the speed of the chart recorder up really fast and that, that would give her more resolution, right? Amazing. Now she's pulling out resolution out of these things. Now look at this. This is actually the first pulsar discovered, LGM-1, Little Green Gun 1. Okay, now look. And then there's one missing. But it comes back again right away. Bam, 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 bam. And then it's gone. And then there's some small ones, but if you measured this, this would be right on one of those. And so now it's like, what is it? And you know, they don't know what it is. But they did know about neutron stars. I, I looked that up too. They knew about neutron stars long before, but there was only speculation, you know, sort of like quark stars now. Okay, Here, this is a totally different one. It's slower. Look at that. Bam, 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 bam. Gone, gone, gone. Now, I'll bet you anything if you measure this distance. No, that's, that's different because that's a different spacing. But that one might be lined up with the beats if you put them in there. Okay, and this down here is just a time base that they use for revving sensors. Okay, Fred Hoyle. How many of you have heard of Fred Hoyle? Lots, yes. Um, he's the one that guessed that it was a neutron star. Okay, so this is a um, kind of a... I don't know how you would describe it, an unfair, really. So she was a, a graduate student at the time, and uh, she's the one that really did the discovery. It would not, and I'm sure it would have been discovered at some point uh, later on, they would, we would have discovered pulsars, but it wouldn't have been these two people. But they got the Nobel Prize. It, it just doesn't seem right to me. And it, was, and it has been really controversial and she's had a really good attitude about it, if you read about what she, what she said in the video. And, and nice, I'm, I'm happy she did get this award in 2018, quite recently, which was 2.3 million British pounds, which she just donated, as you can see here, to benefit uh, physics scientists, uh, refugee students, minorities, and females. And right here is a YouTube book. I hope you can all watch it. It's, quite long, but it's wonderful. Okay. And here's another animation. I just, and, and this is pretty cool because and this one really does need sound effects. <laughs> but this is two neutron stars. And this really happened. A couple of times. The first time it happened in 2015 sometime. Isn't that cool? And uh, what I wanted to say about that, I was in Chile and it was after this happened, but nobody knew about it. It hadn't made the news. So this is kind of a secret between astronomers. But they had already found the optical counterpart to, counterpart to this. So uh, the gravitation, three. Um, gravitational observatories, LIGO, uh, the one in Louisiana, the one in, uh, in uh, Hanford. Hanford, thank you, and then, and then Virgo, which is in Italy, and it barely detected something, but they figured out between the three where it was in the sky, and instead of with only two, it would be a really, really huge area, impossible to search, but they got it down to about 12 or 20 galaxies to look at, and, and they did find it in Italy. Now, it wasn't while I was there, but we were at the table, and I, I, like, I like to talk to these really smart PhD people that are there. And I said, I am so excited about this, um, the LIGO observatory and what they're doing. And they all got real quiet, and they all said, uh, well, just watch the news. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I did. I found out about it, and what a wonderful thing. So that's really what happened. Two neutron stars collapsed. Now, they've actually found a couple more since then, too. 
So this is really ongoing and it's going to get better and better. Oh, okay, so now we're back to, uh, so this is, um, now we're going to get into some fun stuff. And uh, let's see if I can figure this out. It's touching my screen, and there it happens. Event. So, um, in uh, 2010, Dan Gray and I, and along with a few other observers, as I mentioned, we wanted to see this. And so we were able to, um, by one night on the 90-inch Bach telescope on Kitt Peak. <coughs> so that was only 956 years after the, uh, the Chinese saw the guest star appear in the dawn sky. This is a lovely picture taken from the balcony of the 90-inch Bach telescope just before we began our observing run. And here's the Bach uh, itself. Um, you can see the, the, the dome. Um, and it sends a scale, there's a person in a car and in the foreground, and then the, the telescope itself, which is a 90-inch uh, uh, F9 RC telescope. This is not that dissimilar in size and, and, and overall optical design as the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, the Hubble is a 94 and a half inch, it's an F24, but basically, this is pretty much as close as you're going to get to actually looking through the Hubble Space Telescope. And uh, I thought that was pretty cool. All right, here's our, the observers. You can see Dan and I. Dan's there on the, the left, and I'm kind of in the middle left. And there might be a few other faces um, you can recognize in there. Okay, so what do we mean by blinking the pulsar? And Dan will talk about how we're able to see this by means of a, of a chopper that he designed and built. And so take it away, Dan. Take it away, Howard. <laughs> <laughs> So what do we see? Um, now, I also took good notes and made a couple of sketches while we were observing the crowd. And you can see the, uh, the specifics down at the bottom of the screen here of the, uh, the actual uh, technical specifications. We used uh, uh, 1,210 magnification, no filters. The sky was pretty dark, 21.52 on the SQM. And the Crab Nebula and its pulsar was only about 23 degrees above the horizon. Now, um, the, the black strip running across the top of the screen with those dots is my sketch. The, the, uh, the star this is the continuous brightness along the bottom line shows the star next to the pulsar. And you can see the pulsar gradually brightening and dimming, and then into invisibility, and then gradually brightening and dimming. And this is what we saw through the chopper. It was about a two second amplitude from maximum to, to minimum brightness. And it was one of the most astonishing things I've ever seen through an eye crease, and probably ever will, uh, to, to actually see something as incredible as a pulsar in action as opposed to just reading about it and knowing it intellectually. It's a completely different experience. And it was totally worth the effort and the expense to go down to Arizona to, to see this. And you can see also, I've, there's a uh, arrow pointing to the exact little dot that is the pulsar within the Crab Nebula. <clears throat> so my observing notes. Um, that's actually some of my favorite, famous, famous, favorite observing notes <laughs> that I've written. It's like, holy cow, there it is. And blinking with Dan Gray's chopper. It was best seen with the verted vision. You know, 90 inch scope, 16.5 is still relatively faint. But, you know, it was, it was very well seen. But anyway, it was quite obvious once I caught the beat of the two ish second amplitude. Once I got the beat, I watched for about 10 beats before Dan pushed me away from the <laughs> This is a dead solid, awesome sight. 
Sorry, Howard. Oh. <laughs> now, you know, Dan wasn't being pushy per, per se, but yes, he was. I was so excited <laughs> when I was looking in the IP scene that everyone wanted to get, I mean, great people rushed the platform to have their turn. Dan just happened to be standing right next to me. So, and everyone got excited. Um, now here's a little video that gives you a much better idea of what we actually saw. This is a slow motion animation of the crab, and you can see it was taken at a different wavelength than, than uh, visual. But it gives you an excellent idea, and it shows how the amplitude of the pulse arc went up and down as we were able to see it. Now this was done you know, with a special camera from Cambridge University. Um, and none of us at the time noticed uh, painter interpulses as shown on, uh, on this video. But I don't think any of us knew about it, and we certainly didn't look for it. But you can see it very well here in this video. Thank you, Howard. OK, so this is a. Uh the only picture that I could find of the chopper. <laughs> and I wanted to point out, out a few things. So you can see a little gap right there. And that's where you look through when it's spinning. There's also a little gap over here that's a little harder to see. So they're 180 degrees apart. So I, I spin this at half the um, frequency of the pulsar. But a little bit off, not exactly. If it was exactly, it would be either invisible or it would be looking just like your 3D eyepiece. You have to make it be off a little bit. And that's how Howard was able to draw those stars and you can see the beat of the star it was about a two second period. So this right here is where you put the eyepiece and then you tighten the screw and hope it doesn't fall out. <laughs> <laughs> Same thing over here, there's a screw here that you tighten around a, a two inch tube that we stick in the focuser. So that's how that works. And this is a servo motor. A servo motor has an encoder on it. And so you can control the speed of it really accurately. And I looked high and low. I looked at technical brain service. I looked through boxes and boxes of stuff. I found a lot of other stuff. I found my 31 millimeter nagger that I've been missing. <laughs> <laughs> but I could not find this. So I'm sorry, I couldn't bring it. I look also ultra sidereal technology, which is out in Estacada now. Matt and I moved out to Estacada, and, and, and that's where sidereal technology is. And I looked all <coughs> over there and all over TMS. I cannot find this. We'll probably find it tomorrow. <laughs> okay, so here's a here's a. Well, I guess I have to fill the beam. I made another. One. With the help of Victor's, he, he printed this. He printed the disc, he printed the bracket on his 3D printer. Okay. So, here's a little video. When we were playing around with it, my phone does uh, slow mo, we call it. It's about 950 frames a second. So, you can see right there how the light turns on right when the light is on. Oh, I gotta put this on the piece. So, so see, when you, at the very beginning, it looks like it's moving slow, but it's not. It's moving the same speed, but the, the frames per second of the slow of the regular uh, video camera of, on my phone is almost the same frequency as this. That's why it looks slow right there. But then the, at 950 frames a second, you can see it. And look, look at how right, right there, it just, you can see the light turning on at the same time it's, there, it's really cool. And you know, you've all seen old westerns and you see the wagon wheels going wrong. It's the same principle at the frame weight rate of their film cameras uh, of every frame was slightly off and so it looks like they're going backwards. It's the same principle. Okay, so this is uh, Howard's last uh, talk part of it, I think. Um, but uh, you notice that there's a little arrow there, and I think that was added later. <laughs> <laughs>
So this is this is a this is an actual photograph that uh, that Howard uh, made it look more like a drawing by doing some some technology. I think that this is another video. So I just better play it. Here. So yeah, so we didn't just look at the pulsar because the, the crab nebula through the 90s telescope was pretty incredible. Um, the here again the, the location of the pulsar is, uh, is is highlighted, and we use a uh, an O3 filter that brings out the, the filaments extremely well. And uh, we, do, we used only about half, actually a little less than half the magnification, so we could see more of the, uh, of the nebula. But even so, the field of view of the 90 inch was relatively small, and we couldn't see the entire crab nebula in one eyepiece view. But uh, basically, I, I wrote in my notes that I can't sketch all the filaments that jump out with the O3 filter. They're a unique site. I need a good hour to sketch all the detail, and that would cause a riot. <laughs> um, I yep. think we all took more than one turn at the eyepiece to take a look at this because it was phenomenal. The uh, the level of detail. Th this is actually a photograph that I, uh, I, I turned into a, a grayscale, give an idea of what we actually saw, and the level of detail through the eyepiece of the nanny inch might have been actually a little more. Uh, it, it was an astonishing sight. And finally, here's, um, here's Dan and I on the sides, and that's Tom Osipowski in the center there. This is a full-size replica of the 90-inch mirror, just to give you a sense of scale of just how big that thing is. Thank you very much. OK, thank you very, very much, Mark. That was wonderful. Oh, also, thanks to my brother-in-law, Victors, for recording all this. And, oh my god, you have no idea. And printing out this, this little new thing that I, I'm going to show you. Now, you might have to use inverted vision. <laughs> <laughs> so first of all, I'm going to power it up, and uh, the motor's not going to turn, but the light will flash. Now, can you all see that flicker? Yeah. yeah. So that's exactly the same frequency. We, we, got, we finally got the, the right data, that, and I programmed it into this little controller. That is the frequency and nearly the, the, um, the duty cycle, too. It's about 1 to 8, I think, is what the pulsar actually is, about 1 to 8. And so that's about the same. Uh, so I don't think you really, really did need to do that because of word of vision. But um, that's pretty cool. Now, there's a little story about that. I'm going to turn it this way because it's a little annoying. <laughs> um, and uh, I heard about this in Jocelyn Bell's uh, um, talk that she gave at the Perimeter, U uh, Perimeter Institute that I had the link up there uh, with. And, and there, there actually is, uh, it was in the 50s, and somebody was looking to at the McDonald Observatory, a big telescope there, they had the public nights. And this lady said, hey, it's flickering. And the telescope operator said, yeah, yeah, it's just, you know, scintillation, and uh, that's all it is, and, you know, don't worry about it. She said, no, it's flickering. So, so a, a person, and, and it's possible, I, I proved it right here tonight, you can see that flicker. So the next time you're under your telescope, looking in the crab pulsar, <laughs> you're trying to see a flicker. <laughs> But it's it's pretty incredible. So so now I'm gonna turn it off. Now I'll turn the motor on. Oh, I gotta tell you, uh, Daniel, uh, he works for us out there at Sidereal Technology. He uh, put this whole little thing together for us. So it's really cool. He might even be here tonight. I don't know. Are you here? Guess not. Okay. Let's hope let's hope it doesn't fly off in the demonstration. <laughs> Now, Victor's had the idea. I had a big, uh, a great big, I'll show you the big disc that I had. I printed this one out, or I printed the big one out. And 
And since I had a nice vertical LED, he said, we'll make it smaller and then we can see the bottom LED. So that's exactly what is really the light is doing. So it looks like the light is going off and on. So that's pretty cool, huh? So that so that's my talk and Howard's talk. And I can't tell you, I really did enjoy being here tonight and preparing for this talk, and I really did learn a lot, so, and I feel honored, and, uh, and we'll see if, if uh, Mark keeps his job next year. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so time for questions and answers, and there's somebody back here already. Yeah, um, when you were observing oh, hi, Rob. in the dark with that motor in a nice edge spinning around, how did you keep from cutting your nose off? <laughs> <laughs> Good question. <laughs> well, um, yeah. Um. <laughs> wasn't ready for that one. <laughs> I wasn't ready for that question, right? No, I wasn't. <laughs> well, we all survived. <laughs> okay, any more questions? Oh, uh, Ken, is that Ken? Yeah. Um, do you think you could have uh, got the Telstar at home with a modern sized telescope and a video camera? Oh, yes, that's uh, something I plan to do. Um, I have all the equipment, except for I have to make a new chopper, because have, this one is just a demo. But uh, other than that, yeah, I, I'd like to do that one day. Yes, definitely can. Um, Howard? What's the chopper disk uh, material, and how did you balance it? Um, I can't remember how I balanced the one. It was made out of Kydex, the first one. And uh, I probably just did trial and error. Uh, that's, that's probably, no, I don't have the balancing equipment. So uh, if, if there's more questions, I just have to reserve the right to say, I don't know, because I'm not an astrophysicist. <laughs> but uh, any more questions? Okay, we have a couple here, uh, right here first. Yeah, how much does it cost to use the Bob Telescope in one night? Oh, uh, Howard said that. I think it was, God, I, I, I can't remember. It was a few thousand dollars. Yeah, it was a few thousand dollars. But we split it up between 10 people, and so it was about $300 plus an airline ticket. And it was well worth it. It, it was just a wonderful experience. Uh, uh, and um, so one of the original founders of, of Microsoft, uh, he was a financial person there. Um, Man, I can't think of his name. Somebody help me out. Oh, Ellen. Uh, no. Uh, he comes to write at Star Party. Uh, oh, I can't think of his name. But he, but he had connections down there. He was uh, with the Arizona uh, Uni uh, University of Arizona and got it, got it all connected up. I'll think of his name in a little bit. Okay, there was another question right here. Yeah, in, in the video from I think Cambridge, there was the. Okay, that's a really good question. <clears throat> and what that is, is, um, you know, the video that I showed you of that really pretty neutron star rotating with the magnetic field, the pole was like this, okay? And so a planet wouldn't likely ever see that pole. It would have to be over that way. Like if the Earth was there, we could see this pole. If the Earth was over there, we could see this pole. But we couldn't see them both. Well, it turns out that the crab pulsar is, is more like this. And so, uh, let's see, how, I'm thinking about this wrong. It, it, I can't quite visualize it right now, but we, yeah, it's going like this. That's what it is. So the magnetic field is almost 90 degrees to the field of rotation, and that happens to be pointed towards us. There, I got it. And so we see these two flashes, but one of them's up higher than the other, and so it's a fainter. Okay. And nice talk, Dan. Thank and you. Have you, uh, uh, thought of doing that with any other pulsars. Astronomers have done this with other pulsars too. Uh, yes, uh, uh, good question. Uh, I meant to look that up, like I mentioned earlier in the talk. How many um, in, in the talk? How many uh, visual pulsars are there? 
And I don't know that. I was going to look it up when I got here. I was driving in thinking, I'm going to look that up so I can say that. And I didn't do that. I forgot to. Um, but so anyway. Was YouTube. Yeah, right. <laughs> the crab it was the brightest one. Crab is a, the crab pulsar is the, is the brightest visual um, uh, uh, pulsar. There's yeah. one other like it. Okay. Uh, uh, do you know the magnitude of that? Um, it was close to 16. Oh, wow. Cool. Well, then uh, what's the period, you know? Almost the same. Wow. Just about. Okay, well, that's something easily looked up in this day and age, so I'm definitely going to do that. I can tell you about it. Okay, good. Um, any other questions? Okay, well, this is a really fun night for me. I really uh, enjoy being here. And thank you all very much. And how we can we do this? Thanks a lot, Dan. Next month will be our holiday potluck. And it's a members only event, so if you're a member, it'd be great to see you. In the meantime, happy holidays.